Okay. So, imminent patterns of becoming. That was the main subject of the previous class, this morning's class. That's a very important notion because, as I said, imminent, and I'm going to define it again since we're going to be now reaching the conclusion, imminent is the opposite of transcendent. As I said, something transcendent, like heaven or hell, that would be a transcendent space, would still exist if all the matter and energy of the universe suddenly disappeared. Something, something transcendent, like God or the devil, do not depend on there being a material world for them to exist. Something imminent, on the other hand, even though it cannot be reduced to matter and energy, because these patterns can express themselves in a whole variety of, of, uh, uh, of materials and energetic systems, so they cannot be, they, they don't depend on this particular system or this particular piece of matter or that particular piece of energy, but they do need some matter or some energy to exist. They cannot exist entirely on their own. That is what is meant to say that they are imminent to the material world at the same time, they are not identical with the material world. They are something. They are what gives the material world its morphogenetic powers, and we discover them in the material world, or we discover them in our minds as, as something that emerges from the material world. But then, nevertheless, they cannot be reduced to any one particular system. Now, we just saw a few examples of imminent patterns. The simplest ones, but at least we introduced a very important notion of linear versus non-linear. The most, in science at any rate, in physics, chemistry, biology, the most important patterns are not the ones that we just drew. I mean, I, I, those patterns are important, they are called a, a cause and effect patterns. The load is the cause, the effect is a particular deformation, the particular becoming. But an even more important uh, type of pattern in do are those that can be studied via differential equations, via the differential calculus. We already saw that instead of those simple graph spaces that I drew before, with the differential calculus you can study very complex spaces, and right now I'm just drawing a two-dimensional one, in which every single point of the space now has a meaning. In other words, in which every single point of the space is the rapidity or slowness with which curvature is changing at that point in the space. Remember, we talked about this as topological thinking. Topological thinking allows you to extract imminent patterns of becoming from a much wider set of phenomena than pure algebra. Algebra is good when you have something as simple as a spring that you're loading a weight into, but with these spaces can have as many dimensions as you want to. I'm not, I mean, right now I'm drawing a two-dimensional space. You can have three-dimensional spaces, four-dimensional spaces, five-dimensional spaces, which means that you can have many things changing at the same time, not only two, like, like we did before. And mathematicians can actually handle spaces of as many dimensions possible uh, and discover the structure of the space. And the structure of the space is what becomes now the imminent pattern of becoming. The most important mathematician in this regard is a French mathematician from the turn of the previous century. His name is Henri Poincaré. Juan Carré. If it was well written, that's what he would say. He is the last mathematician in history to have had a complete overview of all the different fields that make up mathematics. From, from him on, mathematicians, you know, mathematics has grown so large, and there's so many subfields that uh, 
if mathematicians had had to specialize on graph theory or on group theory or on set theory or on this or that field, analysis, you know, analysis with reals, analysis with natural numbers, Poincaré knew about everything. He's the last grand genius of mathematics. One can only wonder what he would have done if he had had computers available to him. Because computers made mathematics, as I said at, towards the end of the class, not only much more fun and much more visual, but it allowed you to tackle, they allowed you to tackle problems that when you had to do them by hand were incredibly painfully, you know, tedious to do. And most, most mathematicians, although they had an army of assistants, wouldn't even dare to do. So one wonders what happened. He lived at, you know, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. He was, in fact, a royal scientist. He was, he was a major celebrity in the French government. He uh, was hired to do anything that, that the French government, whenever he, they needed to send the face of the, of the science in France to anywhere in the world, they would send and read one correct. And he believed in his own celebrity and his own fame, and he was a deserved thing, so let's not put him down for that. But he was not a minor scientist of the ones that we were talking about before, like Robert Hooke or Fry Otto or any of those. Nevertheless, he came up with something that was very useful, a way of making differential equations visible, a way of studying them geometrically, a way of studying them spatially. And so what he would take is, remember, well, how we discuss these new spaces, which were invented by his predecessors, Gauss and Riemann, another couple of fantastically intelligent mathematicians from the 19th century. They had invented already a geometry based on the differential calculus, a geometry that's very different from the geometry that we call Euclidean geometry. In Euclidean geometry, the most important uh, 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 properties are length, area, volume, and everything is rigid. Euclidean geometry is a geometry of rigid bodies. Just like, you know, rigid cylinders and rigid spheres and rigid cubes. It's what, we, what most of us think of geometry when one think of geometry. But topology and differential geometry are stretchable and foldable geometries. And, and if you are stretching things and folding it and stretching it again, then length doesn't even mean anything anymore. Because something was this length, well now you stretch it, it's a different length. The things that constantly change every time you apply operations are not useful in a particular geometry. Only the things that remain unchanged after you fold and stretch and bend uh, can be said to be important. And in a particular case of topology, or the, and differential geometry, they are both very similar. Only a very few things remained uh, unchanged. The number of dimensions of a particular object and the connectivity of a particular object. Let me show you very fast what connectivity means. Let me take two objects, a coffee mug, I don't. Now, to us, those two objects look very different. And from the point of view of, I mean, they might go together because, you know, you drink your coffee and you eat your donut. But they are very different geometrically. In fact, in Euclidean geometry, those two objects are entirely different. But in topology, if you put on your topological glasses, they would be the exact same object. You could not be able to tell them apart. And the reason is that in any geometry, two objects are identical. If you can transform one into the other using the operations that that geometry uses. Since topology uses folding and stretching, we should be able to transform one into the other by folding and stretching. Let's do it. First, I'm gonna take my donut and I'm going to stretch it in one direction, but taking care that the hole, you know, we're trying to stretch this part of the donut and making sure that this part doesn't get stretched. So we end up with something 